Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Kato. A warm welcome to Changing Tides, Taitorua, a web series that focuses on all things Moana. Thank you so much for tuning in today. At last count, there were over 300 people registered, and who knows how many of you sitting at each laptop, at each screen. So thank you for having us at your laptops, in your living rooms, and your lives during this unprecedented moment in time. The intention of Taitorua is to bring together experts from Aotearoa and around the world to discuss issues facing our moana and the impacts of climate change on our marine environment. I'm your host, Elizabeth Easter. I'm a broadcaster and writer, among other things. And ever since I made the documentary series Islands of the Gulf for TVNZ, I found myself spending more and more time writing about conservation and working with people whose focus is to preserve our precious environment and vulnerable ecosystems. And the more I learn, the more I want to learn and need to learn. And I'm sure that's why many of you are here tuned in today. We are all here because of our passion for the ocean. This series is brought to you by WWF New Zealand and the Department of Conservation. And I would like to thank these organizations for making this series possible. And to thank all our speakers, starting with today's panelists, Joe Harawira, Tom Trinsky, and Di Tracy, and all of you for joining us today. This series will provide opportunities for learning and discussion. We will open up dialogue, encourage discourse, and work towards improving the health of the Moana. To paraphrase Bob Dylan, the tides, they are a changing, and we must change with them. But before I hand to our first speaker, a couple of quick housekeeping matters, chat. Chat windows are open or active for the first 10 minutes of this session. Use that chat ability to ask any technical questions if you're having trouble. Although don't ask me because I have already proved behind the scenes here that I am not a technical person. Q&A. There is a Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen. Type your questions as they spring to mind. They will be filtered to avoid duplication and questions that are off topic will be removed. Voting. If you see a question you want answered, give it the thumbs up and that will help move it to the top of the list. And questions with the most votes will be asked first. Recording. All these sessions are being recorded for quality assurance and training purposes. Actually, no, just public record. And this one will be put up on YouTube tomorrow on the WWF New Zealand channel. If you know people who would like to have been here, please do share it with them. And finally, our co-papa. Please be respectful and your comments and questions. And I know we've heard this a lot lately, but just be kind. It's always applicable. Rule of thumb, if you wouldn't say it to your grandparents, keep it to yourself. So today, our first webinar, you have joined us for Aotearoa A Moana. The indigenous knowledge that Māori share with the Moana provides unique opportunities for understanding and protecting our ocean. Today, we will learn more about this connection along with exploring our marine diversity, from the surface to the deep sea, and how our ecosystems are connected to the wider Pacific region. And now the good stuff. Our three wonderful, knowledgeable speakers, Joe Harawera, Tom Trinsky, and Di Tracy. Leading the panel today, Joe Harawera, he's a storyteller, a teacher, and for the past 20 years, he's been the cultural tikanga advisor at Te Papa Atafai, the Department of Conservation. Joe has traveled extensively, representing his people on the world stage, sharing indigenous insights, his perspectives and experiences, born of a unique knowledge system of connectedness to the heartbeat of the land. And when we were having our planning meetings prior to this event, we talked tech specs and who was using slides or PowerPoint, and Joe said he'd simply be doing a korero, and that his point of power is his tamoko. Joe's talk today, Te Araroa Tangaroa, the many pathways of Tangaroa. And to launch this series officially, Joe will begin with a karakia. Kia ora, Joe. Ke ngā mana, ke ngā reo, rauranga tira mā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ino i tātou. Pau hihiri, pau rarama, pau o te whakaaro, pau o te tangata, pau o te aroha, te pau e here nei a tātou. I would like to ben, begin our, our webinar by acknowledging the many voices that have come on our webinar today. And it's my understanding that uh, we have 
overseas um, cultures and peoples who have um, zoomed in to our webinar. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge you. I began the session with a karakia, and I did it in the Māori language, which is the Māori language, which is the language of this land. And um, I, there's a reason why I haven't translated that karakia. All I ask you to do is to hear the spirit of the word, the spirit of the language, the spirit of the Māori language, the language of this land. And so, no mai, piki mai, kake mai, welcome. I'd like to begin my court at all with a, a little bit of a story. In the beginning, there was nothing. The unknown nothing, the unseen nothing. The beginnings of my times, the beginnings of our times, the beginnings of me, the beginnings of us, the beginnings of we, the Aborigine, of Aotearoa. Io, the creator, began the configuration of the universe with a sacred karakia and a wayata. He had children, Rangi and Papa, whom bore many, many sons within the darkness, within the confines of darkness. And at the separation, they had many sons who were given responsibilities. We call them kaitiaki. And one of the sons was given the responsibility for being the kaitiaki, the guardian, the, yes, the guardian of the oceans and the waters. And his name was Tangaroa. Uh, my connection to Tangaroa is one of what we call in Aotearoa, New Zealand, whakapapa. Whakapapa is about connection, connectedness, um, and being connected to a source, to a heartbeat. And so my knowledge and my experiences and my understandings around the marine um, ecosystems and this guardian, Kaitsaki called Tangaroa, have a connection back to our being, our creator, Io Matua Kore. So connection for me is about um, energy. It's about the radiation of my energy and my heartbeat and connecting that to Io Matua Kore. To, to Rangi and Papa, the Sky Father Rangi and the Earth Mother Papa, and to their son, one of the many sons, Tangaroa. Whakapapa is, a, is about layers and it's about connection. And I liken the energies of our connection through heartbeat to the ebbing tides, the ebbing tides, the flow, the ebb and flow of uh, the, the moana uh, or the oceans. Within the, um, the domain and my way of viewing uh, the moana and the oceans and our ways as Māori, we have many microcosms of um, knowledge and things that make up a whole in a holistic sense. And whakapapa is just one of them. We have a, what would you call it? We have a, an understanding of working in two paradigms and in two worlds. The spiritual world we call the kauai runga, the metaphysical world. The spiritual world, and we also have the kauai raro, which is the, the, the physical world. Tangata, people who are living. And our understandings and knowledge of interactions and working with the moana have come from centuries of, of, of observation and interaction uh, with the moana. Uh, our interactions with the moana have determined our ways of seeing, our ways of being, our ways of knowing, our ways of understanding, which are prevalent in all of the, the purako, our stories, which are prevalent in the karakia, our prayers, which are prevalent in the wayata, all of our wayata and in our, our stories. And so all of those contain matauranga, or knowledge, and in our case, matauranga Māori, which are determined by what we call tikanga, or protocols and processes. 
tika is the root word of tikana, and tika uh, means to do, th do things right. And these protocols and processes uh, that came about through these observations and interactions with Tangaroa um, and with the marine uh, ecosystem um, have determined um, our ways of working and understanding her. And so the Te Ao Māori view of the moana and the oceans is comes back to connectedness and it's it's um, incumbent, I think, in, no, incumbent's not the right word. We, we can see that in a saying from the Wanganui people. And that saying goes like this. Mai ngā maunga ki te moana o au te awa ko te awa ko au. As the rivers flow from the mountains to the sea, I am the river. The river is me. Tangaroa and people, I view and we view Tangaroa as a sentient being, a person. Um, and we interact with Tangaroa as if it is a person because we understand that the emotions and the things that we feel as people, Tangaroa feels exactly those same things. And they're based around concepts of Modi. Modi is a life principle life force. So Tangaroa has a modi based around the word mana, integrity. So Tangaroa, the father of all of the things under the ocean and within the ocean, has mana, integrity. Uh, tangaroa has wairua. Tangaroa has a spirit, just like you and I have a spirit. And Tangaroa to we is a sacred being, just like you, as an individual, are a sacred being on this planet that we call Earth. And so with those concepts imbued within the person Tangata, which is the kawairaro, the physical realm, if we stretch back and reach back into the spiritual realm, that is the connection. So everyone listening to this webinar at this moment in time has a life principle, has Modi, and so does our oceans and our seas. Everyone listening to this webinar has mana. You have individual integrity. There is nothing, no one like you as an individual on this earth except you. You are special, just like Tangaroa and our marine system. Everyone listening to this uh, webinar has a wairua, has spirit. Everyone listening to this webinar is a sacred person on this earth. And so the acknowledgements to Tangaroa are the same as the acknowledgements to people, to people. And we used, um, that concept of Modi, Wairua, Mana and Tapu um, to the tiniest of the, the organisms in the sea has Modi, has Mana, has Wairua and has Tapu right through to the blue whale has Modi, Mana, Wairua and Tapu. And that is our connection to, to ourselves and in fact, to our creator. So I think I've only got through half of what I wanted to get through. But uh, the voyaging, of course, the Māori people, we use the ocean currents and the flow uh, for voyaging. We observe the stars to get from point A to B. Um, those of you who live by the ocean, uh, Hirere, um, have an intimate connection with the ocean. Um, for as a food source and for recreation. Um, and I, I suppose for me, the ultimate thing is around sustainability. And we understanding the impacts of climate change uh, and the unsustainable practices um, that, have a, that are affecting the Modi, the Wairua, the Mana, and the Tapu of Tangaroa of our oceans.
te nāko utau. Kia ora. Kia ora, Joe. That was uplifting. Thank you so much. And our second speaker, because we want to get through these so we can get to our Q&A, because there's a very good one, the question that's already popped up on the screen. But our second speaker is Tom Trinsky. Dr. Tom Trinsky is, uh, has been working in the field of marine biology ever since he was a small boy growing up in Australia. And he'd be looking under rocks for crabs and in tidal pools for anemones. And the lucky man, he has turned that boyhood enthusiasm into his profession. Tom is now Head of Natural Sciences at Tamaki Paianga Hirihira, the Auckland War Memorial Museum. In over 30 years, Tom has led marine biodiversity surveys across the Pacific, mm -hmm. from Indonesia to French Polynesia, and science engagements with indigenous communities. Tom was actually meant to be on a research vessel right now, spending four weeks sailing from Rapa Nui, the Easter Island, through to the Pitcairn Islands, finishing up in Tahiti. But lockdown put a stop to that, and Tom has found himself marooned in Tamaki Makoto. But on the bright side, it does mean Tom can talk to, to us today. His focus, marine biodiversity in New Zealand, how we fit into the South Pacific region, and what is so special about Rangitahua, the Kermadec Islands. Kia ora, Tom. Oh. Tom. Hang on, I have to unmute myself. <laughs> ah, good. Here we are. <laughs> Kia ora tato. Um, thank you very much, Elizabeth, and thank you for the... No, uh, I just look. Are we okay? Zoom. Can you hear me? Yes, all good to go, Tom. Please okay, continue. Good. Thank you. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, for the introduction, and thank you, Joe, for the karakia and, and uh, your korero. Um, I put this up because um, you all know that the world is made up of 70% ocean and the Pacific Ocean is the largest of all oceans. I do want to acknowledge that the, uh, the Pol Polynesian, Polynesians and eventually Māori who settled New Zealand made the la largest voyage ever on earth um, and they used their mātauranga to, to get to, new, to Aotearoa. So my background is actually in larval fishes. Uh, that's the stage after, um, after fishes hatch out of the egg. And uh, that is the, also the very important stage that fishes use to disperse across great expanses of ocean, mm -hmm. not unlike our Polynesian voyages. The Pacific Ocean is huge, but it's um, spot dotted with very small islands. Um, and large expanses of ocean in between. Um, the challenge is how do things disperse across these large expanses of ocean and how do they find them? Um, and this is something that I've been interested in all my professional career, um, thanks to my um, background in larval fishes, but also my opportunity to go travel around the Pacific Ocean. As Elizabeth said a few weeks ago, I should have been cruising the east, uh, east, central eastern Pacific. Just to give you a little bit of background, I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a biology 101 session, but the important thing is that almost all fishes spawn eggs that turn into larvae and the larvae are the dispersal phase of fishes. And then eventually the fishes do settle somewhere, most fishes at least, and they settle into their juvenile habitat and sometimes stay there for the rest of their life and, and a bit that becomes their adult habitat. So in a way, this is the way that things can, can jump from one island to another and make large migrations across ocean scales. Um, it's important to understand how these things are connect, connected because what we see in the ocean environment is totally dependent on the ability of larvae to disperse and not all larvae can disperse in the same way. Larvae interact with a whole range of oceanographic currents most of them spend time in the surface waters and they spend weeks to months at sea. Some of them make um, huge migrations of thousands of kilometres and some just a few kilometres and some even less than that. But the, but the key point is that they have to interact with the ocean and the ocean is not a uniform mass of water that doesn't move around. Um, it varies in both space and time and uh, that influences what species occur where around the ocean. 
getting to a more regional scale. So this is New Zealand. Um, and uh, you see that the main ocean current that influences at least the northern part of New Zealand comes off the East Australia current. For those of you who remember finding Nemo, that was the current that um, Nemo was riding down with the turtle down the east coast of Australia. During this um, warming period of ocean environment over the last few decades, that East Australia current has strengthened quite a and here's some grinding there, has strengthened quite radically um, and um, has changed the fauna and, it, and the marine biota that occurs down the east coast of Australia. Things that didn't occur in Tasmania are now occurring um, and breeding in that area. The Tasman front, which you see coming across to northern New Zealand, the other bit of or orangey red, is actually the warm water current that hits the top of the North Island and, and nominally brings warm water species across to northern New Zealand. You also see a lot of cold water currents in blue that hit the bottom of the South Island as well. So putting that into a regional perspective, since I've been here in 2007, I've had the fortune and the opportunity to uh, lead a number and participate in a number of expeditions across the Pacific. And the main reason is to try to look at how Northern New Zealand is connected to the rest of the Pacific, biologically connected that is. Um, I won't go into any of these expeditions, but I have had, had the opportunity to go to Rangitahua, the Kermadec Islands, seven times. And that is in the northern part of New Zealand's exclusive economic zone and is an important um, area of study, which I'll get to in a minute. But I have had the opportunity to go to some very remote islands, most of which are uninhabited, to, to um, discover the biodiversity with, with um, colleagues to discover the marine biodiversity of those areas. Some key points that I wanted to make about what we've discovered is, first of all, that we still are in an era of discovery. Um, it's actually quite hard to believe that every time we go to a new island or an island group, we increase the known diversity of fishes by 10 to 20%. Um, we make many new species discoveries and similarly for seaweeds and, uh, and invertebrates, we find similar scales and sometimes in invertebrates, greater scales of new discoveries. And what we're doing is building our knowledge for bio of biological connectivity among the islands that helps explain the distribution of these species and also building models to predict changes over time. And we are in a very dynamic um, time in, uh, in the... Anthropocene, which is the era of human impact, where sea temperatures are changing, currents are changing, storm events are increasing in intensity, and also um, there's a lot of fishing pressure as well on a lot of these islands. Some of the findings we've found is that some things that have, were considered uh, one species have, have been identified as representing more than one, probably more than one species. And interestingly, the areas, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, um, the things that are most similar to what's found at Rangitahua are actually not the, uh, not the, not the populations closest to it, but further to the east um, around Rapa Nui. Similarly, the most common reef fish at Rangitahua um, is um, a small damselfish, which has the same name as what's at uh, Rapa Nui or Easter Island, 3,000 kilometres away but it looks quite different. It's much more yellow and looks more similar to um, a golden coloured um, damselfish that's uh, just to the north of us here uh, at Rangitahua, that occurs just to the north of Rangitahua. Whether it's a new species or not is still under investigation. So looking at the location of Rangitahua on the land, on the bottom scape of the oceans, um, you can see we have a very large continental area, which is all the yellow and green area, as well as what's emergent above sea. Much of it is, vo is volcanic, and particularly along the Kermadec Ridge. It's adjacent to the second deepest um, trench on Earth in, the t in Tonga, just to the north of Rangitahua. And so it's a very dynamic and very interesting um, marine environment to, in to study. Part of the reason for that is that um, it is one of only... Now, get this. It is one of only four islands in the world that are considered pristine in that they have not been influenced by people or very little influenced by people. Three of those are in the Pacific. They're the black dots on this map. Two, two um, on the, off the west coast of Central America, 
Rangitaha, which is number two on the left-hand side of the chart, and one more location. Why this is important is that um, there are virtually no places except these four where we can study marine systems in the absence of influence by people. So it's very hard to tease out natural changes to marine environments and separate those from human influence changes without these bellwethers of change on these four islands. So Rangitaho is an important area for study and research. Things that we've found is um, a, a very common species of urchin across the Pacific, which was thought of as one species, was described as a new species of rat from Rangitahua, and now has been found to occur in, in a much broader area as well. Similarly, um, uh, some of the uh, microscopic algae that um, cause ciguatera toxin, I won't go into that, but it actually makes fish quite toxic to people, but not to other fishes. Um, but um, it, um, it has been found at Rangitahua and close relatives of the same toxin has been found at Rangitahua. In a global environment where sea temperatures are increasing, could that ciguatoxin turn up in northern New Zealand and potentially um, impact some of our fishes that we, we like to eat as well? It's just a hypothesis, but um, certainly something that we're actively following with, um, with, uh, with some of our colleagues. This is um, a graph of the species of fishes that have been discovered at Rangitahua over the, over the many years. Just on one trip in 2015, we discovered nine new, uh, not new species, but species that have never been recorded from there in the past. All of these are tropical fishes. Remembering Rangitahua is on the margin of the tropical islands to the north and the temperate, temperate seas to the south in northern New Zealand. And it effectively is a stepping stone for some of these tropical species that eventually could turn up in northern New Zealand. And with warming temperatures, and as I said, um, uh, currents that will change, Modelling predicts that some of these species will in fact turn up in New Zealand over the next decades. The oceans have been doing us a very huge favour. We have, certainly a lot of people have been noticing um, on land at least, changes in atmospheric uh, climatic conditions, whether it's storm events, uh, icebergs uh, melting and glaciers melting. Um, and so they're, they've been quite moderated. Some of those events, even though we're noticing them sea level, changes, big storm, big sea storm surges. But actually the ocean's been doing us a big favour in absorbing almost all of the atmospheric carbon that been, has been generated over the last hundred or so years. Um, and it's only a matter of time, and obviously that's having an impact on oceans before that gets saturated and the impacts on land will become more intense. I can't finish this without presenting this, um, without presenting this uh, graphic of catches of fishes across the oceans that had reached their maximum sustainable catch in a particular year from the 1950s up until about 2000. And as an area becomes red, it actually has become uh, reached its maximum sustainable yield. And as you see by the year 2000, pretty well all the oceans except for the Antarctic have reached their maximum sustainable yield, which does tell us something about the pressure that people are putting on our, our marine by our marine species, particularly the larger attractive species that we like to eat. Um, so I'm just going to finish up talking about protecting these areas. Some of the island nations around us to the north of us have made huge strides in trying to protect species that occur around their um, ocean, ocean scape. Um, uh, for example, Palau in Micronesia has protected over 80% of its EEZ uh, from fishing. Uh, Pitcairn Islands, Fiji has a target of over of 50%. Many islands are now starting to realise the impacts of some of these, um, that some of these uh, fishing and human-induced pressures are having on their environments. And the reason they're protecting this is protecting marine environments increases resilience of uh, systems, marine systems, to, to major global impacts, whether that's climate change, storm events or whatever. Um, also protects their reefs from damage, and that, that also protects islands from storm events. It helps build fisher, fisher, fishery targeted species, but it can't compensate for massive overfishing. Um, and also it helps return ecological function of marine systems. And I've had the benefit of working in Rangitahua, where, uh, where 
working in a system that is fully functional and has all the ecological levels present in it, if you look at the image behind me, there's 12 sharks in that image and there's very few places left on earth, in, even in my lifetime, that, I can, that I've seen big changes in a number of sharks that occur in some of these remote reefs. So it's time to, do, uh, to change. It's time to look after our connected ocean system. And as Joe said, restore the Modi of, our, of Tangaroa because that's the most important aspect of what we have to achieve. And I've been really enjoying working with Indigenous communities across the Pacific to try to help restore some of the integrity of their marine system. Tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora, Tom. That was fascinating. I think most of us would love to go to the Kermadegs and it's not a book a seven day package sort of place. So um, shining a light on the Motu and the Moana around that area. It's just so interesting. Although also, yes, there's some serious news in there as well that I hope we take note of and do something. Right. Okay. Third speaker today is the wonderful Dai Tracy. Dai Tracy is a fisheries scientist at Niwa, Taihoro Nukorangi and she's been researching deep sea marine life in New Zealand waters for decades. Interestingly, because um, what Tom was saying, there is always something else to discover in the ocean. Last year, Dai's team, one of the stars that they discovered out of 600 new and potentially unknown ocean species was a worm that feeds on bacteria and has no eyes. And I would be very proud if I'd found that. Now, Dai also works on aging deep sea fish and has now moved on to aging some of the most ancient and threatened corals in our region. Dai's talk today, Deep Sea Corals in New Zealand Waters. Kia ora, Dai. Kia ora, Elizabeth, and tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Dai Tracy aho no tai horo nukarangi. Thanks to DOC and WWF for inviting me to participate in this webinar. It's certainly been great to listen to Joe and then Tom's korero uh, just now and get their perspective about our marine biodiversity, Maori, no Ma Maori knowledge and connections. Um, in my talk, I'll take you all a bit deeper into the dark waters of our marine realm, in fact. So, um, I'll mainly be talking about uh, deep sea corals. A lot of people in the audience know that we have deep sea corals in the region, but probably not all of you. Um, and my hope is that the coral information won't be out of sight and out of mind by the end of my talk. Uh, quickly thanking the funding agencies who've supported a lot of the deep sea research in our region. So I'll talk um, about protected deep sea coral fauna. Hidden from view at depths of 800 metres or more live a range of diverse and colourful deep sea corals. And an understanding of the science of this group is required both by scientists and managers. So I'll describe what corals we have in our region, show their distribution, present some age data, and briefly mention species associates, anthropogenic impacts, and um, the oceanographic and geological environment in which the corals are found. And just to start off, of course, we know that um, New Zealand is the fourth or fifth largest EEZ in the world and supports incredibly large um, biodiversity and abundant deep sea fauna. Phylum Nideria, the corals and enemies and relatives, um, are one of these abundant groups. And uh, Tom's mentioned Rangitahua a lot, and we do have some warm water um, stony corals up in the Kermadec region. They look a bit like this, uh, shallow water scleroctinians close to shore and like this. And you would have seen images um, such as these in the Pacific region and off Australia. Uh, occasionally long dead fossils float up onto our Northland beaches and we get asked to identify these fauna. So we do have these shallow reef-like corals in our region. Also in shallower waters, for example, um, in the Port Knights Island region, we um, have in about 45 metres, um, amazing and diverse uh, ecosystems such as this. And here we also see shallow water corals, primnoid sea fang corals and golden corals. Uh, Swimming over this ridge here in the shallow water are two-spot demoiselles and clustered um, amongst the corals are some orange sponges. But there are many more cold water corals in deeper waters. 
And the images I'll show you um, in these next few slides have all been taken by the Niwa Deep Sea Toad System, DITIS, and it's deployed off Tangaroa, our research vessel. And I assure you, having been on this vessel for many years, it's not always this calm when we're at sea. So the black corals, they sometimes are uniplanar and tall, like this coral in this image, bushy, tree-like, and the image in the middle is a black coral from the fjord region in the dark, shallow cold waters. But these corals, the same genus, also occur in our deep sea waters. One of the most important groups are the scleroctinian stony branching corals. They form large, fragile 3D matrix colonies, reef mound or thicket structures that ex have existed for hundreds or thousands of years. Uh, they're made up of calcium carbonate, carbonate, the aragonitic form of calcium carbonate, and the upper zone where you see all these pink and white um, parts of the reef are live, and the lower region comprises dead coral framework that supports this live matrix. These corals provide biogenic habitat on slope, margins, ridges, and seamounts throughout our region. And it's the dead and live matrix, both parts that are really important, and act as refuge for some fish and invertebrates. And our research focus has been on impacts on these corals in particular. And for me, understanding how old these corals are. So we take small samples, small branches from these coral reefs to identify them and then age them. They don't always um, live on hard bottom substrates. Sometimes these sclerotinian stony branching corals occur on hard substrate and 400 meters on the top of the Chatham rise and flat slope. And here you can see little clusters of Agonio corella coral swimming over this um, area are banded bellows fishes and inflated sea urchins, uh, echinoderms, or tamashanta urchins. Within the scleroctinian coral group, we also have cup coral forms. These are found on soft sediment, but also attached to hard substrate throughout our region. And some of them have bioluminescence. Another key group are the primnoid sea fan corals, Gorgonia nocta corals. And here's a whole lot of sea fans just circuiting this uh, little outcrop here. And this uh, large orange animal here to the left is a, um, a brisingid sea star. The diversity of our three key families of Gorgonia nocta corals is probably the highest in the world for a single country. This is another Gorgonia nocta coral, the bamboo coral. It too luminesces. And we've aged colonies of this coral up to 400 years. Primnoids sea fans uh, occur throughout the region. This amazing image of biodiversity was taken in the Macquarie Ridge area. And let's not forget, we also have other key uh, deep sea fauna in our region, such as the sponges. Another Gorgonia nocta coral are the plexorids, an incredibly colorful group. And the charismatic bubblegum coral, our coldy of the deep. This reaches massive sizes, and this image is also in the Macquarie Ridge area. You can see the whole colony overarching in the currents. And at the base of the um, coral, you can see sheltered here, a whole lot of small corals growing, bottle brush corals and other small bits of um, primnoid sea fans and bubblegum corals. And we've aged one colony of this bubblegum coral to 500 years. They seem to have a faster growth rate than some of our other corals found in the region. There are the uh, hydrocorals, the uh, stylasterid hydrocorals, delicate lace corals, and they're found also in many um, shapes and forms and colors, pink, red. And you've already seen this um, Google Maps image from Tom, and it certainly shows how extensive our marine realm is, and it's managed by several government agencies. And the ones in blue are the ones who fund a lot of our research. For DOC, um, they have legislation that provides spatial protection to our corals. And the Wildlife Act protects black corals, Gorgonia nocta corals, stony corals, and hydrocorals, the groups that I've just introduced you to. Fisheries New Zealand also has a role to manage the corals, um, and that comes under the requirement of the Fisheries Act. 
and I uh, lead a couple of projects that are supported by Fisheries New Zealand and DOC to identify incidental bycatch of species collected by observers from deep water and middle depth fisheries. And these examples on the screen here are some of the corals that have been collected by observers from our region. So the knowledge of our fauna has certainly advanced substantially in New Zealand since the days of the Astrolabe voyages and Terra Nova. These days we don't use Agassi trawls but sit in darkened rooms on Tangaroa for hours on end looking at video footage to identify the animals that we're seeing in the deep sea and also um, identify what kind of substrate they live in. The coral distribution knowledge has extended from what we knew in the 60s um, which was quite a lot of information around the coastal region and a little bit out to uh, Rekahu near the Chatham Islands um, to an incredibly um, wide knowledge of the distribution of corals inside our exclusive zone in the high seas and also in the Ross Sea. Um, but there are still a lot of gaps. Um, I've mentioned seamounts quite a lot and I'll just pause for a moment to introduce you to seamount features. This is a 3D swath image showing the shape of the Andes Knolls to the east of the Chatham Islands. And often the corals, um, especially those Claractinian corals, are draped over the summit and down the flanks of these seamounts. And to give you some perspective, I grew up under the Taranaki, this wonderful mountain. And it is the same size as Le Havre, a, a significant seamount in the Kermadec uh, Ring of Fire region. So um, we have a really good idea of, from our taxonomic and molecular studies about how many coral species we have, um, well over 1,300 in the region, at least 500 still need to be described, and we have a lot of endemism, at least um, 200 endemic species. We use um, guides um, to instruct observers and researchers um, to identify uh, the coral fauna. We uh, carry out, um, we produce a lot of spatial distribution plots and carry out quite a lot of habitat suitability mapping of the corals in the group, where they are and where we predict they also may be. And um, as promised, some aging data for some of these corals. The branching stony corals have incredible longevity. If you're looking at a long dead matrix, uh, that has been aged to well over 10,000 years. If you're looking at just some pieces of coral colony, we've aged some of these up to um, well over um, 2,000 years as well. Uh, for the black corals, for example, Leopathies, we've dated to well over 2,000 using radiocarbon dating. Um, Bathypathies are, are not as old, have a um, lived to around 300 years. But again, incredible longevity with these deep sea corals. We're beginning to look at species association in relation to the corals. We're still teasing out the information about orange ruffy um, and other species that always seem to be associated. And um, so we're just trying to link up that information. Globally, there's definitely associ associations between fish and corals. Then clearly there's an association between invertebrates and corals. Scott lobsters, here's one nestled onto the branches of a black coral, um, are often seen also perched on the top of these uh, matrix, the reef matrix, um, in the currents getting food. Ophiuroids are often wound around the branch of a black coral or other species. And we've looked at a lot of stresses um, on the coral communities. Anthropogenic impacts include fishing, and our research has demonstrated appreciable impacts from bottom trawling with little or no evidence of recovery in the short term. And of course, that's not surprising because these corals are slow growing and long lived. So the commercial scale bottom trawling is a major risk. So too is climate change that Tom's already mentioned. A changing environment of ocean temperature is um, a concern. We haven't looked at bleaching, but we have carried out experiments looking at ocean acidification. And we're also looking at sedimentation impacts on these corals. What we've noticed is that the pink tissue, the senenchyme, that covers the branches of some of the stony corals disappears under elevated pH, which was an ocean acidification impact. And um, just to finish off, off the uh, geological ocean and oceanographic setting is also paramount to understand where the corals are. 
corals fall at the natural confluence of biology, hydrography and geology. And so we need to consider the environment as a whole when we're studying these animals. And we regularly collect oceanographic and substrate data. So in summing up, the need for engagement, of course, is paramount and needs to be two ways. We all need to talk to each other to make sure we're doing the appropriate research. We often communicate our science via risk assessments, workshops, engagements, and I'm really thrilled to participate in this webinar today and engage with you all. And I hope that the knowledge of our coral fauna and this quick snapshot that I've given um, in the deep sea is no longer out of sight, out of mind for a lot of you. If you need to know more, hot off the press is our state of knowledge guide uh, report. So uh, thank you, na mihi ki a tato katoa. Kia ora Dai, that was great. And I love the thought too of the confluence of those, of coral being the confluence of those three quite separate, you know, but differing things. That's beautiful. Now, question time, we're very limited. Can I please remind people, um, if you give something a thumbs up, it will rise it to the top of the heap. Um, the one that rose most quickly to the top of the heap was um, a question. I'm not going to name people as well because this will be going on YouTube later and you haven't given permission for your names to be used. Um, but one question, I think maybe if we start with Joe, how do you reconcile the importance of conservation in the Moana with getting a feed for the Fano? Yes, it is, uh, it is a bit of an issue uh, with, uh, with iwi, uh, Fano and Hapu, uh, with the likes of. Um, um, lockdown, uh, so to speak, from a, from an iwi perspective, uh, in terms of marine reserves, and so I understand that the um, the Ministry of Fisheries have got mechanisms in place to um, and are working with iwi to uh, work through that particular um, issue. Um, but I think um, iwi understand that um, the unsustainable um, practices that are have been carried out because of economic drivers or, or the like are impacting on our ability to practice what we did um, in the old days, which was to go down to the Moana, take what, what was required to feed the family and um, keep the, the resource in a sustainable uh, way. And so um, we have to um, work with the times, but it is uh, uh, still an issue for a lot of our iwi. Um, also, too, I want to make it clear that some of the other panel discussions are going to focus very specifically on climate change and marine protection per se. So um, if we don't cover those questions now, please don't think we're ignoring them because they are actually really important to all of us. But um, I will go and throw a question to Tom here right now. Um, Bridie has asked, is there evidence of tropicalization occurring in the Kermadex? Is that why there are more species being discovered during each expedition? or is it due to increased sampling effort during each expedition? That is a great question because that's the question we ask ourselves. Um, the challenge with uh, getting to Rangitahua is that it's a very remote area and it's very expensive to get there. So our opportunity to go to Rangitahua is actually quite limited. So when, when we're finding these additional tropical species there, you're right, it could be just because we're sampling new areas or going, going there repetitively and coming up with new species. I think over time we will be able to confirm whether it is tropicalisation. Um, there's a project uh, I'm involved with with Libby Liggins from Massey University looking at population genetics and source populations for some of the species that occur at Rangitahua and some of which are actually starting to appear in northern New Zealand or have appear in larger numbers in northern New Zealand. So there's some indications that warm, the warming waters possibly is increasing the incidence of uh, tropical species, both at Rangitahua and in northern New Zealand. And um, that's just a, a part of ongoing studies, both with Libby and with, other, with the students as well. So watch this space. Lovely. And then we also have a question now for Di about um, coral and we've got a couple actually about coral and deep sea trawling. But do, um, oh, where's that one for Di gone? Yeah, what is the importance and context of corals in our knowledge of climate change and marine ecosystems? I think that's you, Di. Um. That's a few questions it sounded like. <laughs> Give me <laughs> the, one um, of them. Oh, you, you can. The, the, well, the, the, um, the coral 
Coral provides an important habitat, an ecosystem, where there are a lot of different animals. So if we remove part of that ecosystem from trawling, um, that's a huge concern. We have um, closed some seamounts to fishing to protect areas. We have um, areas that are closed to fishing within the region. And so um, that's definitely occurring. But, but the teasing out fish associations with these coral hab habitats is quite tricky, to be fair. Um, because we see uh, aggregations of orange ruffy over flat bottom where there are no corals, and we also see them aggregating around these seamounts where there are plentiful corals. So it's quite hard to tease out that information, but there's definitely some kind of connection there to, to what fish eat and then what the diet of the fish is that links back to the corals for sure. I hope that answered the question. I would have would seem to be too faceted one. And also, too, someone else has asked in the coral department, is there anything the public can do to increase uh, coral protection? Well, um, I've been thrilled to give this webinar today to um, inform people that there are a lot of deep sea corals in our region. And then it is just um, really just um, lobbying the decision makers, our government agencies who, who protect the corals, DOC, um, but that doesn't mean that there are a lot of areas protected within our region. Thank you. And I'm not sure who will uh, want to take this, but it's uh, if tropical fishes arrive in New Zealand, will it have consequences to endemic fish species? And are there some that are vulnerable to a change in the community structure, like with New Zealand birds, for example? Can someone... Oh, Tom. Probably, probably me. <laughs> um, look, that's another good question. And it's something we don't often know until after things have arrived. Um, some years ago, about 2013, um, uh, a sea chest was opened up of a, of a large uh, super, uh, yacht that had sailed from Tahiti and it took six weeks to come from Tahiti and it was full of juvenile tropical fishes. I've actually got some here, by the way. Um, and it, it was very risky. Fortunately, they didn't open the sea chest and just empty it, which some people do just before they, they come into port. Um, but we don't know what the impacts are. Certainly, we know when... Um, species that don't belong in a place. For example, the lionfish, the Pacific lionfish that was introduced to the east coast of the US or someone dumped it from an aquarium is now a major pest in the Caribbean and the south southeastern part of the United States. Displacing local species, um, they're, they're not good to eat, they're toxic if they're, if they're touched. So there can be some major impacts that we, we can't predict until they actually arrive. And once, unfortunately, once a marine species arrives, it's very, mm. and it, if it can breed in the area, it's actually very hard to get rid of. And we have some marine species, not of fish, but of invertebrates and seaweeds that have been introduced uh, that have caused problems and are displacing native species. Lovely, thank you. Um, and then we do have a um, one more coral question. Has there been any evidence of corals showing improved resistance to warming oceans and ocean acidification over time? If so, how long would it take for corals to build up this type of resistance? Uh, we don't have any data in this region for that. Um, we, What we saw from our experiment was that they lost a lot of the senenchyme tissue, which meant that the branches were, were getting quite weak. Um, so that kind of strength of the corals um, would become more brittle. Um, as the CO2 increases and the pH changes, we also see a change in the aragonite saturation horizon, which corals use to make their um, um, skeletons. And so they would have less available to make um, those skeletons. So we can just assume that this would happen at the moment. We have no, no evidence. Um, in our region, but it was great to do that small experiment um, and to get that kind of um, result um, because that had been seen by global researchers as well. Oh, lovely, thank you. And this question is for Joe. Um, can you please explain more about the relationship between Kaitiaki Tanga Māori and Wairua? Yeah, Māori is a life essence, um, and uh, in a sense, they're, they're both the same. But Māori, um, um, and, and translation into um, into English doesn't do the words justice. You've got to feel it in the heart. Modi is a life essence. Wairua is is a spirit, the spirit of a thing. 
Lovely, thank you. And then we will do one little um, marine protection question, just because it is um, important, and also it's quite a um, quite a topic at the moment. Tom, the Kermadec Marine Protection Area. Do we know what the plan is for an extension? Or um, I know this is a complex issue, but is there any known plan? Well, the government did an, the pre previous government did announce it to the UN that um, it was going to be. Uh, um, legally designated um, and uh, unfortunately that didn't go through. Um, I, th I think the government misstepped in not consulting sufficiently before they made the announcement. Um, I, I am hoping that in, uh, in time that will happen, mainly because these large ocean sanctuaries have major benefits for, for, big, for species that do um, travel across oceanscapes, things like tuna, things like uh, Tuna as in um, the fish that uh, is in sushi, not tuna as in the freshwater eel. But they have benefits for some of these large migratory species that cross oceans as part of their life cycle. Um, so in time, perhaps it will happen. I think it would benefit the whole community around Rangitahua. At the moment, it's only rings of out to 12 nautical miles, but eventually most of the EZ around the Rangitahua could potentially become, become a marine protected area and join others in the Pacific that have already done that. Cool. Um, we've probably got time for only one more question and this is a very big question. And please too, people know that um, at the end a tile will come up and you can also send uh, questions to moana at doc.gov.nz and that will come up at the end and those questions are important. So this is to Tom and to Joe. Um, uh, one viewer is interested in your perspectives, how you would balance values when it comes to marine protection, particularly given the differences in worldviews between Indigenous and non-Indigenous in the special context of New Zealand with the Treaty of Waitangi and the 1992 fishery settlement between Māori and the Crown. So oh, that's a big one, but um, maybe Joe first or Tom? No, Joe first. Joe. Uh, <laughs> with three minutes. I was just, um, I was just thinking about, um, uh, after the uh, first question, um, LAW and LORE and the impacts on our ways of knowing and understanding um, from an LORE perspective by the Western LAW. Um, and so I think I've forgotten the question. Um, so the, um, the difference in worldviews between Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Yeah, I think it behoves us all to understand each other's custom, uh, culture and ways of understanding and, and thinking to be able to come to a um, um, a consensus, I suppose, of how we can better approach those um, ways we see things. I think there is valuable, uh, there is value in understanding the Indigenous perspective because Indigenous perspective has science in it as well as Western science mm -hmm. and, and us, we understanding the Western science as well. And oh, how is it that we weave into that fabric um, of of um, understanding the world around us. That's my short and simple answer to that. So if I could just finish up on that, and you're exactly right, Joe. We shouldn't see Mātauranga Māori or any Indigenous knowledge system as a dichotomy between science and the Indigenous knowledge system. Where I found the real value is where the two come together, as you say, Joe, we're woven together and bring a lot more value and, and also benefit in understanding systems. Um, science is just an approach and an evidence-based approach to, to gain knowledge. Polynesian cultures also gain knowledge in means of kaitiaki, uh, particularly of marine environments. They developed their own marine protected area systems through Rahui, uh, Hataitai, uh, no, um, and so, uh, Mataitai, sorry. And uh, I think, um, it's not, it, they're not novel ideas. I think when we confuse the two uh, knowledge systems together is when we get the best value and the best bang for our buck. And that's just, and working with, with iwi and um, pol um, Pacific cult cultures that I've had the, had the um, privilege of doing, um, my awareness of both the uh, spiritual and physical aspect of the uh, habitats and the species that live in them has certainly been broadened and, and certainly has increased my awareness of a different way of looking at things.
Kia ora, Tom. And thank you, Joe, too. That was a great answer to a big question. So thank you all so much. I wish we had more time, but this conservation conversation is ongoing. And so do please join, please join us next week, same time, same channel, same Eventbrite booking system. And uh, next week is Our Changing Seas with Dr. Juana Smith, Dr. Richard Levy, Levy and Dr. Carolyn Lundqvist. Kia ora, ka kite anō te whanau. And now to close our session today, oh, I have to also say, I got the email address wrong before. It's not Moana, it's marine at doc.gov.nz. And to close our session today, I will pass back to Joe for a karakia. Kia ora. Kia ora. I'd like you to repeat after me. Kia kotahi mai. Ki te ao nei. Be as one with the universe. Kia kotahi mai. Ki te whenua nei. Be as one with Mother Earth. Kia kotahi mai. Ki te wairere nei. Flow as one with the sacred waters. Kia kotahi mai. Ki te hau ora. Breathe as one with the winds. Kia kotahi mai. Ngā tangata katoa. Let us be one together in our pursuit of marine studies and knowledge. Patu ki tahi ngā manawa e times four. That basically means let our hearts be in sync with the heartbeat of Tangaroa, and only then will we have true balance in our lives. Tēnā koutou, kia ora. <laughs>